Um, I'm Steve Truboff. I'm the chair of the board of trustees for uh, Littleton Healthcare. Um, I've been on the board for um, I've gone on 12 years, and I've been in the community for about 40. And you've all read about this arrangement in the paper. Um, people have stopped me on the street and said to me, what's it really all about? And the purpose of these community meetings is to try to explain to people what it's all about. Uh, where we are today, how we got there, uh, why we're doing this, what's going to happen next, and so forth. Uh, Warren West, who's our CEO, he's you're in your seventh year now here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Closer right. to eight, but who's counting? Yeah. Certainly Depends not me. Time goes quick when you're having fun. The, uh, he's going to talk about the whole sort of context for this agreement and where it stands, and then it will take about 30 minutes, and then we will answer every and any question you might have. So, thank you, Steve. Thank you all very much for coming out. Um, when it was raining, thundering and lightning, I was not thinking too many folks would make it, so I appreciate your time tonight. Um, put, a little things in, put some things in context. My hope today is to talk to you about the environment and sort of what led us to this direction. What this direction may or may not mean, because we have a lot of work still to do to make it happen, the timeline associated with this project, and the approval process. Um, as Steve said, we're going to go through this for about 30 minutes, answer any questions. I would be happy, though, at any point during uh, the presentation, if I say something um, that you have a question about, just put your hand up. I'd be happy to answer it then as well. So put everything in context. Um, small rural hospitals in America. Um, for the last two years, at least, I've been telling folks out there that I think small rural independent hospitals, such as ourselves, are potentially going to become dinosaurs. Um, someday we may go be extinct if we don't change our course. And the more and more of the environment that's changing in more recently uh, days, actually, it's even getting worse than that. So you've read, I think, or seen a ton of affiliations going on in this state throughout the country. So I want to set that in context with what's going on. The other challenge we have is our board, um, very dedicated folks, 15 to 17 of them, come together on a regular basis to plot the future of this institution. And that's their job. It's getting tougher and tougher to plot that future when you try to understand what is in the environment today. You try to read the tea leaves that you think are going to be in the environment tomorrow. And quite frankly, tomorrow is still a little gray, depending upon elections and changes. Um, but we have to figure out the course of this institution for the next 5, 10, and 20 years if not longer. Because the board's job is to make sure this institution is here in this community for as far as we can think out into the future. Um, so they've been working really hard on this project. There's still a lot of questions that we have to answer before they're in a position to approve this type of project. Um, but some of the future we understand, some of the future we don't, and we have to read these tea leaves. And quite frankly, we've been fortunate at Littleton Regional Healthcare have some very successful years in the past. And we can't rely on those successful years to think that's going to be our future. So we really have to think about what's right for this institution. So what's going on in the country that is um, making our perspective change? This is actually some quotes that I got out of an article just today that hit my inbox. The article was titled, Nonprofit Hospitals at a Tipping Point for um, Mounting Challenges. Here are some sentences that came directly out of that article. Small standalone nonprofit hospitals are facing mounting pressure from weak operating margins and lower patient volume. Hospitals have done a pretty good uh, job cutting costs, cutting jobs, cutting costs to deal with declining revenues. Last year, with the additional pressure of declining volume, it has been the straw that is breaking the camel's back. And many hospitals in this country their backs have been broken, and we'll talk a little bit about that. To shoulder these challenges, smaller providers have increasingly sought out mergers with larger health systems 
in order to seek scale and efficiencies to offset increased operating pressures. Large healthcare organizations can better leverage their scale with vendors, insurers, eliminate duplicate services, absorb major AT project costs, as well as att attract top management and positions. When I saw this article and I pulled these quotes out, I said this is all about what we're talking about today. In a snapshot of what's going on in the environment. Sorry, Warren. Uh, why are the patient volumes getting lower over time? Most hospitals, unlike Littleton's, we were atypical of this, have been losing inpatient volume and have been losing outpatient volume ever since the Great Recession. And more and more people are transitioning from a traditional um, insurance product to a high deductible, and they're not accessing care. Um, we've been lucky, as I said, we haven't had those trends, but that is happening nationwide. Um, our inpatient volume, as you know, is going up a little bit. Our outpatient volume over the last seven to eight years has gone up. This is atypical from most of the hospitals in the country. So this is really a snapshot of what I want to talk about tonight. Um, so what's going on? So the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, Obamacare, ACA I prefer to call it, um, is changing the entire health care landscape. The number one principle of the Affordable Care Act is to drive cost out of the system. The number two principle, in my humble opinion, is to provide more and more regulation that costs more in the system. And that is true. Um, part of that first statement I said to drive costs out of the health care system, the federal government cannot afford what they're paying for Medicaid and Medicare. They're going to be reducing our revenue streams. The state, in turn, with uh, disproportional share payment, is a way to compensate us for the federal programs that underpay our costs. Now, let me just explain that for a minute. So Medicare pays about, if it's a dollar of cost for care, they pay us about a dollar. Medicaid, if it's a dollar of cost per care, they pay us about 46 cents. You can't live on volume when you're losing that kind of revenue on all the Medicaid population. So the state has a plan that compensates you back for that. That program is at risk because the states can no longer afford it. Shift, this is definitely out of the ACA, shift from volume fee for service to quality outcome. What does that say? So today, every time you come to the hospital, whether you come for therapy, you come for a lab, you come for an x-ray, we get paid on a per service, fee for service, a fee for service. So every time you come in, we bill for something. The federal government eventually wants to change that to a different compensation formula, where it's based on outcome. It might either go to capitation, which means we'll get paid on a per member per month basis and have to take care of a population, or the bundle payments. The best way I can describe bundle payments is, let's see, I was getting a knee replaced, and today um, you get charged for a physician, you get charged for the hospital, you get charged for the OR, you get charged for the rehab, you go to a nursing home, you get charged for a nursing home, and you might get charged for home health when you go home. Federal government wants to say, we're going to pay all of you X number of dollars you figured out. Um, so there are different approaches that are coming our way. So we need to be prepared for those. And lastly, as you've heard, this year there was a narrow network in our state for the pathway product. More than half the hospitals were excluded out of that network. These things are not going away. And more and more opportunity out there for insurance companies to say, no, we're not going to keep you in the network. You're either too expensive, you don't have your quality standards up, we don't need you or want you. So these are all threats to what's going on at small hospitals. Um, so that's what the future sort of holds in the healthcare environment in the country. What is going on in the North Country that adds to those challenges? So, our region, population. Right? You've all read it. We are the most economically challenged, and this is cost county statistics, 
most economically challenged in the state and the sickest in the state. Our county, our population, our region, our service area is not growing. Increasingly, the population we serve are aging and Medicaid eligible. And what did I just mention to you about our Medicaid payments? 46 cents on the dollar of cost. So these are some real challenges to our North Country healthcare establishment, if you will. And the last point here is we've lost a lot of large industries in this area. Many, many folks who've had really good private insurance, it's declining, and a lot of folks and a lot of companies now are providing high deductible plans. High deductible plans keep your monthly payments lower but if you get sick, there's a lot more money out of pocket. And a lot of folks who have signed up for these plans don't understand what the end game is with all this money out of pocket and cannot afford it. And therefore, a lot of those <coughs> charges end up in bad debt. So it's almost a double whammy in the North Country. The environment of the North Country, the environment of the US health system. Two big challenges. So what are hospitals doing to meet these challenges? About three months ago, maybe four now, time flies that you have a lot of fun, um, four hospitals closed their doors in, in Georgia. They just shut down. What happens is, when you talk about regulations, and the healthcare industry is probably the most regulated, and you talk about the overhead associated with running a hospital, and if you have declining revenue streams that can't keep up with the cost of overhead, you got a business. You can't make it work. So many hospitals across the country are closing. It's happened recently here in New England. North Adams Hospital, North Adams, Massachusetts, the board of that hospital on a Wednesday said Friday the hospital's closed. Shut down. They are not operating today. That hospital is presently um, trying to be purchased by Berkshire Hospital. Their offer on the table is $4 million for a hospital. That's, that's worse than a fire sale. When you think of the assets we have here, about $100 million that a hospital sells for $4 million, that's because their business model isn't working and a whole lot of other reasons. So we are certainly trying to prevent that. What are other hospitals doing? Let's talk even closer to home. Memorial Hospital, Conway, New Hampshire. They merged, and I'm going to use the word merge, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. They merged with Maine Health out of Portland, Maine. Recently, we've seen it in the newspapers that New London Hospital, New London, New Hampshire, merged with Dartmouth Hitchcock. I would predict that four to five other hospitals will be merging with Dartmouth Hitchcock in not too distant future. And it's a merger. Now why do I keep using the word merger? What happens if you join the Dartmouth model today is Dartmouth has um, reserve powers over your operating budget, your capital budget. They place three board members on your board. They have the right to uh, reject any board member that's at the table. So they've merged, it's a takeover. We are not prepared to do that, even though we have talked to Dartmouth. At this point in time, we think there's a better plan out there for us and the North Country. But these mergers are happening more and more all over the country. Small hospitals know that in the future, bigger is better. Because you can't take risk-based contracting. You can't take advantage of economies of scale. You can't get your costs cut fast enough keep up with where revenue is going, unless somehow you figure out how to be bigger. So what are we doing? I forgot how much, was it three weeks ago? We had a press conference at Mount Washington. <coughs> we did it intentionally in the North Country. We announced we signed a letter of intent. And that letter of intent is posted online for any of you who are interested, and I'll show you the website at the end of the presentation. Uh, we signed a letter of intent with the hospital in Berlin, the hospital in Lancaster, and the hospital in Colebrook. 
to form a parent corporation over four hospitals. Because all four hospitals are critical access hospitals, and none of us can afford or want to lose our critical access hospital status, we will all need to maintain our own provider numbers and our own board. And therefore, we have to form a parent corporation over us to sort of help think how we can make a better system in the North Country for healthcare. Because if we were to start from scratch, we probably wouldn't be as designed like we are in the North Country with all these organizations, four hospitals, the geographics, the um, competition, the overlap of services. So this is what we're trying to do. All of our hospitals share the same mission and value about serving the North Country. We want to maintain our own identity within a larger system, because size does matter. And we believe we're going to be much stronger together. But we still have a lot of work to get there to prove that. Um, this is a difficult process to try to pull all the information together so our boards at all four of these hospitals can make the right decision for their institution as well as for the North Country. So I talked to you about what a merger looks like. This is more of an affiliation. It's not a takeover, it's not a merger. So the local hospitals are going to maintain core services in each of their communities. The economies of scale, because we are big, are going to help with cost issues whether it's a centralized business office, whether it's you know, combining all of our human resource benefits. Uh, there's all sorts of ways to drive out costs in the system when you're bigger and you're together. Your economy is a scale you can take advantage of. The synergies between us and, and other community hospitals, and you can manage care more effectively when it comes to readmissions, discharges, if you have a cohort of patients, i.e. the North Country patients and their population, we can care for a population among all of our hospitals as opposed to individually. And the affiliation hopes to ensure uh, to sustain access to local high quality care for the people in this community. Um, even some hospitals in the North Country are clearly struggling financially and are concerned about their future. We're not quite in that boat today, but we are concerned about our future because we're not sure that the tracks we're on are going to continue forever. I clearly believe at some point we're going to find a fork in the road and we're going to have to take it. And so that's what we're studying. So, we talked a little bit about the North Country Solution, four hospital family. And we believe this is the first time in the country that four hospitals have come together without a, a large medical center or tertiary care facility. A lot of hospital systems are formed around the Dartmouth of the world, the Fletcher Allen's of the world, the main health of the world. This is an opportunity for our hospitals to do something different and to develop their own solution for the challenges in the North Country. We talked about maintaining our identity, our own identity because of regulations and requirements and I think we think the communities are going to want that. And we will exchange some individual autonomy for the ability to jointly develop a highly coordinated healthcare network that serves the North Country. Our goal in this project is to make sure we have a financially sustainable healthcare system in the North Country. Now, if you think about the North Country and its, its economy, the four hospitals in the North Country are probably the largest employers in each of their towns. They probably have the largest payrolls in each of their towns. And they are, we are, one of the strongest financial engines in the North Country. We believe talking about that, we believe forming around that will help us when we need to go to Concord and ask for help because folks like to support the North Country. So we do believe it's an innovative approach. It's good for the communities we serve. It preserves local hospitals and it positions us for all the challenges I talked to you about, not only just in the North Country, but the challenges of the healthcare environment that we're in today. So what's going on today? A lot of folks are headed south for healthcare. And is there a way, if we build a stronger, more integrated delivery model in the North Country, can we prevent folks from traveling and keep them local? Can we make sure that each of the doctors in each of the facilities 
know their peers in each of the facilities so they know their capacity? Is there a way for us to develop centers of excellence around orthopedics, around ENT, around cardiology, around all of the medical specialties with the medical staff we have? Because we all know, if you're in this industry, the more volume you do, the better quality outcome you have at a lower cost. So if we can develop these centers of excellence in various hospitals, we're going to be better off in the long run because we can drop our costs, our quality will go up, and we'll have people doing really good volume so they can provide higher quality. So what do we have to do still? We are committed to this process, but as I said to you, there is a lot of work to do. All four boards need to be in a position to feel this is the right thing for their institution, their community, and the North Country. And we still have to provide our, our boards with a lot more information than they have today to prove that, to validate that. We think it's the right idea, but we've got a ton of numbers to crunch and a lot of planning still to do. We've got to do our due diligence, which we're just starting now. So we're looking at financials, contractual <laughs> obligations, legal, the environmental assets and liabilities of each of the four hospitals. Down the road, we'll be drafting a definitive affiliation agreement. This document must be approved and reviewed by the, uh, the four boards. As importantly as the Attorney General has to buy into this, we will be having public forums between now and the time that we believe we'll have a definitive agreement. The Attorney General mandates public forums in each of the communities before they will decide on your application if the definitive agreement will be approved. Um, and at some point, if all the stars line up, we may get to closing and an agreement signed. This is an approximate timetable. Um, I'm not sure we can keep to that with all the work that needs to be done. I don't know. But we're going to do our best to stay on track. So we do believe we have an innovative approach. We do believe that the best thing for the North Country is the folks that work and live in the North Country to come up with their own solution for health care in the North Country. We do believe there's a huge value to preserve the four hospitals locally, maintaining access to care in those various locations, and that this is going to position us for the future. We have a lot of work to do. I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wrote down. Um, what specifically will the hospitals do together that will lower health care costs and improve the quality of care? Um, eventually the sense of excellence. So eventually we will, we will say that Hospital X will be the center of excellence for a particular service. As we do that, as I talked about, higher volume, higher quality, lower cost, that is what happens when you bring volumes to a certain institution. B. I talked about the possibility of forming a central business office to oversee all of the business, if you will, financial business, accounting business, all of that in one area. That would drive out some costs. C, I mentioned earlier, we need to look at our HR benefits together. We need to look at everything we do as an individual institution, and if we bring them together, we'll be, we'll be able to drive costs out of the system that way as well. And I, I, I have two things. I mean, if you think about it, you have four institutions and they all have a big billing department. Um, hospital billing is, anybody knows has ever received a hospital bill, knows this is not a simple matter. Um, add up the people you have in four hospitals, you don't need that many people to do it. There's huge savings there, and more importantly, there's the ability to access the kind of expertise you need to get it right. And I think on the quality side, um, as you know, the, the U.S. government requires all kinds of quality tracking. We have more data here than most people know what to do with. Um, there's a huge cost to collecting that data and doing anything about it. 
and the kind of programs you need to build to improve your data. Uh, hand washing, aspirin, all those things that add up to good quality scores, those systems cost money to train and teach people. And spreading that over a larger base of people, practitioners, employees, and whatever would have a huge impact on driving down our costs. IT, we all have different IT as well. Us and Weeks have identical IT systems, which is a very good thing. Um, the other couple hospitals do not. They have different IT systems. But can we standardize an IT system? Do we need all these experts on three or four different systems? Or if we standardize, you know, will it be an easier way for implementation? Okay, you might have to standardize in electronic Correct. Electronic. Correct. All right, question two. Okay. Um, how, if anybody else can jump in with the, if I'm being too um, hoggy. How will this collaboration improve public health? Um, we have our dear friend here, Nancy, who works with the North, health, North uh, Country Collaborative, Health Collaborative. Um, they specialize in public health. We are, there's two parallel tracks, and I really tonight was here to talk about the parent corporation concept that we're trying to move forward. I hate to go down this road, but I think it's going to answer your question. We are working on a separate track with all of the hospitals in the North Country, all the FQHCs in the North Country, the home health agencies, the nursing homes, and Nancy's program. Right, well, I, and we're I, gonna used get work, I used to work for the health consortium. Perfect. So I was wondering, well, I'll just go to my fourth question then. Oh. Why, since you have that infrastructure of the North Country Health Consortium, why wouldn't that be a good vehicle to implement a lot of these changes? It's gonna be a great vehicle to implement it. So, back to my story about this other arm that we're working on. So we're working with all of those agencies today to put together what we call a community care organization. That community care organization is basically um, a physician hospital organization on steroids. In the past, hospitals and physicians came together to contract with managed care companies uh, for risk-based contracting. Many hospitals let those just die because they weren't needed anymore because capitation went away. We are trying to get everybody in the tent in the North Country so we have a mass of covered lives. So we can go to the ACOs of the world, um, whether it's Dartmouth or um, Care One in, in Vermont or some other ACO that pops up and says, say, we got 35,000 covered lives in the North Country. We have an entire continuum of care, including preventative medicine in the North Country. Um, we can take a capitated rate because we have all the services covered. We're working together on credentialing, we're working together on claims management. We know what our costs are. We know where our high performers are. We're driving out variation in, in care. Um, we're using medical protocols and best practices. So that's how we're going to improve public health. We've got the preventative arm. we got the primary care docs. We've got all the specialists. We've got the hospitals. We've got the nursing homes. We've got the home health agencies. Um, we can help drive down um, our readmission rates, both in the hospitals and in the EDs, with help from the um, home health agencies. So we think we have a plan to take care of those pieces. And the CCO, as we have talked about it and started planning it, will be at the consortium, within the consortium's organization. Okay. Um, and we'll just collaboration provide better reimbursement from insurance carriers? We don't know. We believe, I believe, I shouldn't say we, I believe all reimbursement is heading down. I don't believe we're going to get reimbursed any more tomorrow for anything we get done today. I do believe if we're able to drive our per unit costs down because of centers of excellence, because of high volume, high quality, lower costs, hopefully, we'll be able to survive on the reduced rates that we're going to be receiving. And I'd like to think that translates to reduced premiums for the citizens in the North Country. That's the one piece I can't control. What I think I can control is get our per unit costs down so we can keep, um, hopefully, rates will continue to grow like they are today. But, but think about it. The politics of care in New Hampshire, if you have a single entity north of the notch, makes it very difficult to ignore that entity in almost every type and kind of decision. 
and insurance and insurance payments are only one piece of that. The dish payments and what the state doles out is increasingly important. And the state can do many things, but it can't ignore everything north of Franconia Notch. No, and, will it? I mean, Colebrook this year got half a million, half a million dollars extra. Um, and they really got a half a million dollars extra because they the needed it to stay open. They needed to keep it And keep once you have a single entity negotiating that, your negotiating position really changes in terms of your ability to get leverage, particularly with the state. And that they're a major payer. Mm -hmm. um, it will be for ever. Is that four? I think we, we missed one. No, oh, that's four. All right. Yeah, I think you have a nuanced question, so I'll back off from the You can ask oh, Corey. We, absolutely. Any other questions that anybody else thinks of or wants to ask? Yes, ma'am. I didn't fully grasp the slide. The two slides where you showed the different geographies and where we can travel to now for but care basically, and how that's going to change, yeah, possibly. Fair enough. Basically, we have a lot of folks who believe uh, they need to travel to Manchester, Concord, or Hanover for their care. There's some folks that believe that not every referring physician in the North Country knows the full capabilities of the specialist in each of the hospitals in the North Country. I'd also suggest to you that maybe some physicians in a hospital today who believes we're a competitor do not refer to say Littleton because they believe we're a competitor and folks get sent around. And if we're all in this boat together, and we're all one big happy family of four hospitals, I believe we're going to be able to keep folks from needing to go to South for care, improve our quality, improve our, our, our outcomes, and we'll be able to keep more folks in the North Country. I also think that's going to help the folks who live in the North Country who can't afford to drive to these other places. You know, when, you make, when we make some referrals to some of our patients, first thing out of their mouth is, I can't afford to go to Dartmouth. Can't you take care of me here? So that's what the point of those slides were. I'm sorry I wasn't clear. No, I, I, I understood what the point was. I just yeah. didn't know how you got to the map yeah. to show full time slide too. That's right. Um, and my other question was, how, who defines what ports, the port services are? You, you said that each individual has to maintain its core services. That yeah. is going to be up to the local boards and the parent. Board, as they have discussions about what is needed, what's the cost ramifications, as we pull together the system. So you should, you know, we've got the system now of four hospitals. We compete with each other. We have overlapping services. We have overlapping specialty services. Not only just medical or clinical services or MRIs, but we got overlapping physicians. We we got to figure out what we can afford, what the population will bear. Um, and how we can juggle that among the North Country so people can stay as local as possible based upon cost-effective care and positive outcomes. That's how it's going to be determined. Yeah, yeah, I, I that. Any other questions? Whoa! Okay. This family is dominating! <laughs> Go ahead. Four A. All right. No, I'm <laughs> curious why um, Woodsville wasn't included or considered for this, <coughs> this uh, affiliation? Um, at this point in time, it's difficult enough to get four hospitals together, let alone a fifth or a sixth. Other people have said, where's Plymouth? Um, so at this point in time, it's difficult enough. I don't think we'll rule out anything if we can get our definitive agreement completed. Um, but right now, you got four hospitals, four boards, four medical staffs, four communities. That's a tough equation to make this all happen. So that's the best answer I can give you. And I think it's important to understand the other three people, not us, actually already have a joint venture for their home health and hospice care. It's true. That they've been running for quite a bit of time. In amongst themselves. Yes. 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 They merged those units, all of which were a problem financially and by putting them together they sort of got it up to break even I think and they also have much more cross-sharing of physician and other services which they've had to do 
Um, for those of you that go up to Colebrook, you know it's a long way there and they don't have the same sort of resources. So they really came to us. Um, we represent probably 55% of the total volume of the four units. So the three of them together plus us gives you the core you need. And I think once you get this together and figure out how to do it, um, I think anybody else who wants in, it'll be very clear what the terms and conditions are to come in. And I would think Woodsville would have an interest. You would think Spear would have an interest. Um, you know, the guys in North Conway are gone. They're part of the main medical system now. Um, so, I mean, I think that'll happen over time. But at the inception, it was really the three of them, and we sort of joined yeah, them. Yeah, the three invitation. of them then invited us. Yeah. We didn't think we could bring we somebody else to the, the dance. Party. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Just a question from a theoretical standpoint to Steve and you, the board. Being that, compared to Colebrook, we might be the stronger link, is there any concern that we would be aiding them more than we would be being aided and we might be averaging ourselves down rather than merging with somebody stronger than the us? The answer is, it is something the board talks about on a regular basis. Oh. And through the development of the definitive agreement, we need to have some protections in there. The real, the real answer here is the board is very clear that they're not going to subsidize anybody else's losses. Um, we're this, this is a little bit like the EU. Um, we're not interested in taking Greece. Um, you know, this isn't going that uh, international, is it? <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean that unkindly, right? But, but the reality is, there's a real concern about that, and several of the hospitals are in much better condition than the other ones. Um, we all have endowments or money that we've saved up over the years. And we don't want to use that to fix up the other guy who hasn't invested in the facility for 25 years. And so part of this definitive agreement is to specify out the standards that each place has to make. And I believe ultimately that will be the biggest driver of change. Um, some of these institutions haven't made a lot of money for a very long time. And you just can't you know, take in less than you spend year after year after year catches up to you. So, yeah. And so I think we're at a point here where some of what's going to drive change are the finances of all this and everyone's being very careful about that because we're not the only guys that have an endowment. Um, so do they, they have one in Berlin, they have one in Lancaster and all of the people want to protect that and separate it so that we don't inherit each other's problems. But we are building financial ratios in that each of the hospitals have to maintain um, so that doesn't happen. Yeah, financial performance standards. And the system will be developing quality finance, uh, quality standards for the system, so there's a lot of work going on that. Good question. Thank you. What else do we got tonight? Could, could you explain the community care organization a little bit better? I didn't really understand the link between that and the health uh, <clears throat> The community care organization is coming together with all the parties that I mentioned earlier. You've got all of the four hospitals, there are three FQHCs in the North Country. An FQHC is a fairly qualified health clinic. The one we have here in town is Amanusik. Um, the one in Berlin is called Coas County. And the one up in Colebrook is called Indian Stream. Um, we're all coming together to develop this, F this CCO. The CCO will be housed over at the North, Ca uh, North Country Health Consortium. And we will use this vehicle to go to the federal payers and to the private payers for risk-based contracting. It will be our infrastructure where we'll be able to receive revenues and distribute revenues back out to the providers, collect quality indicators, make sure the doctors are performing at the highest possible level, um, and if we're in a bundled payment program, the CCO will figure out how to distribute that money to all of the providers. If we're in a capitated program, the CCO will figure out how to make sure we can take care of population health. You know, so maybe you <coughs> all don't understand this concept of uh, capitation. So the federal government will say to us, or could say to us, you guys have 25,000 Medicare population in your region. We will pay you $10.50 a month for every covered live you have in this region. Some of those patients 
might go to the doctor once a year for a physical. Some of those patients, I hate to say this, but might have a heart attack or a stroke and be hospitalized for many days. We still have to provide care for that $10.50, and we've got to figure out a way to spread those risks over that population. So instead of each of these institutions um, taking their 5,000 covered lives and going to an ACO and say, please let us in, we'll have 35,000 covered lives in our own organization to help us pull together what we need to do for population health. Thanks. You're welcome. Wow, silence. <coughs> Anything else? I was either that clear or I just confused you guys so badly you can't come up with any more questions. Hopefully, I was somewhat clear. Yes, sir. It's not, apparently, it's not a done deal. I think a lot of people sort of. It is not a done deal. What do you, how do you calculate the odds? Today? I think it's better than 50-50, but there is a lot of work to do. Um, there's a lot of due diligence to do. There's a lot of information gathering that we have to prepare for our boards so they can make the right decision. Because each board has to act today on what's right for their institution. And that's going to be the biggest challenge. I, I think, uh, Greg, it's, it is better than 50-50. I think everybody understands you've got to do something. We can't go on the way we're going on. And from our standpoint, we'd rather do it from a position of strength when we're making money and we have nice facilities and good people and everything. Not wait till you're in trouble. Um, but the devil is in the details. And, you know, it's easy to say, well, let's put our patient financial services groups together. Okay. Um, is it your guys that are going or my guys? And where are we going to put it? And how are we going to do it? And which system are we going to use? And I think we're at the stage now where we've talked about the engagement and marriage and how wonderful it is. And now we're talking about where we're going to live and whether we're going to own a dog and all those other little details of life. And I think over the next three, four months, we'll really find out you know, how, how much everybody wants to do this. We're all going to give up something and we're all going to get something out of it. And, I, you know, we will continue to inform people. I think in general, having met with uh, people that run the other institutions, Warren's peers, um, and having met with the board chairs of the other places, I think that everybody's marginal propensity is, is to do this. But everybody's being very careful, because you only get one try. Um, but I think it's a pretty good chance, and I think we'll know by spring yeah. uh, where we stand. The details done in the paperwork and the government and all that kind of stuff, I think, will fall into place if the people fall into place. But there's a lot of work still to do, and it is not a done deal. Um, we're headed in that direction, but we've got to get through. And what are our options? Um, good question. Would you repeat that? What are our options if it doesn't work out? Plan B, huh? Yeah, what's, what is the uh, I don't think I have a plan B today. But I think we're going to work on it between now and the time we figure out if this is the right thing. I, I think it's fair to say the we as a group have maintained a relationship with Dartmouth, but we have not taken the Dartmouth deal. Um, the Dartmouth deal is a takeover, and we weren't interested in being taken over by Dartmouth for all kinds of reasons. Um, that's not a reflection on who they are. That's a reflection probably more on who, who we, we are. are. Absolutely. But that is a plan B. Um, we could go down there tomorrow and say, we're ready, guys, and they're glad to, you know, appoint your board, approve your budget, hire your CEO, and you're part of the Dartmouth-Hitchcock system, and that's what New London's done, that's what Alice Dave Peck has done, that's what Claremont did, and that's what some other people are going to be forced to do. So that is a plan B. We, we would prefer not to get to plan B. Um, it could be. I mean, and down the road, guys, if this is successful, um, there's nothing to stop us from having a relationship in some fashion with Dartmouth, who has a ton of in infrastructure around ACOs and chemical care organizations. They're already taking risk-based contracting. They believe risk-based contracting is going to change the world tomorrow. We don't necessarily think it's going to turn that fast. Um, but we're never going to rule out some type of relationship with a tertiary care facility 
especially one that is as close to us and one that probably gets 95% of our tertiary care referrals. Um, but we want to go down this road and we want to make sure that if we are able to pull off a North Country solution driven by the North Country folks, that's what we're going to do. So, Scarlett. So, you know, we like you say, I'm going to some of our pensioners and affiliation with art. But we see Fletcher Allen as we talk with the one here, trying to do something with Maine or trying to do something over here. We have a little bit of association through our lab there. Maine's coming in too, just down the road from us. Yep. And as we know, they only have two huge systems in Maine, pretty much. Three like, now, but yeah. yeah. I mean, if you think about it, and that's a really good point, before you finish that, yeah. I mean, if you think about Maine, the state of Maine today, um, just to drive home the point about small independent hospitals are potentially dinosaurs, Maine has three major health systems. I would say to you, 95% of the hospitals are associated with one of those three major health systems. There are very few independent hospitals in Maine anymore. On the other side of the river, west of us, um, whether they're successful or not, Fletcher Allen is trying to have one health system in the state of Vermont. I'm not sure they're going to be successful, but that is their goal. So folks are headed in this direction. Our state, in this particular category of mergers and affiliations, is slightly behind. Um, and I can elaborate on why, but I better not. Um, so back to your question. There will be other suitors, I believe. And I guess that's where I'm going with yeah. it. I knew where you were going. That is going to happen. Obviously, Dartmouth's been there a long time. They're in the state. But, see but you've got, you've got um, the G5, who have recently uh, brought in um, CMC. Um, and they might be somebody who would like to affiliate with us. They've got Concord and CMC. I don't know where it's going to go. All I know is we're presently four independent hospitals. Together, we'll probably have combined revenues of over $200 million, um, which will be one of the bigger systems, in, not big, one of the biggest, but one of the bigger systems in the, in the state of New Hampshire. We'll have force. We'll have the ability to, to choose it's, our future. It's also not unlikely that you are going to see people have multiple affiliations. Um, so, for example, Dartmouth has a deal with the Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. um, it also has a deal with Children's Hospital Boston. Um, if you were going to make a children's deal for us in the North Country, you're far more likely to go to Boston Children's Hospital than you are to go to Dartmouth. Um, if you were going to make a remote webcam emergency room kind of thing, you're more likely to go to somebody like Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic who are starting to do that nationwide. And I think you're going to see different affiliations around different practice areas and different parts. I think this is going to get pieced apart a little bit. Um, and once again, the bigger you are, the more leverage you are, the better control you have of what you do, the more attractive you are to those kind of institutions for feed of the things that they do better than, or that you don't even do at all, and, and never will. Um, so it remains to be seen. As you know, Parker's Health has crossed the border. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a $5 billion engine moving north, right? How far north remains to be seen. Remains to be seen. So. We think there's options down the road once and if we're able to pull this off. Wow, good questions. Good dialogue. Anything else? Thank you for coming out on a beautiful evening. <laughs> we do appreciate your attendance and your interest. Um, the goal here uh, is to have these on a regular basis as we learn more about the process. Um, this particular website is a website where we're going to be posting documents right now at that website. Now at that website are some frequently asked questions that was associated with the press release as well as a copy of the signed letter of intent in its entirety. Um, so if you have any interest in how the board structure may end up, um, if you have any interest in seated powers, and I mean, have at it. It's a great legal document. Just don't read it too late at night. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We have a lawyer here. Uh, <laughs> but thank you all very much for coming and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.